Yani Madad, welcome. Thank you for joining us for these conversations. We hope that you will find these an insightful and interesting conversations for you to reflect on for your own lives. This week we are dealing with and talking about Mediation Awareness Week, and in particular, issues around conflict resolution, early conflict resolution, and for us, I think more importantly, conflict prevention, because it is in preventing conflict that really the sense of happiness and stability and safety of the Jamaat is, is enhanced. Perhaps there will always be conflict. Of course, there will always be conflict. But how we deal with it is incredibly important. Today, I am very pleased to have an opportunity to have a conversation with Camille Orridge. Camille is a community activist par excellence. For 50 years, she has worked in healthcare to take on progressively more and more responsibility leadership positions but she has never forgotten where she's come from and that she started her career and her life as a young immigrant, a new immigrant doing housekeeping. And that part of her reality always remains front and center. And she has a particular attention to the marginalized communities. She knows that healthcare delivery requires equity and fairness and of a concerted effort to look at systemic barriers uh, of world much larger than healthcare. She has received many accolades for her work outside of healthcare as well as within healthcare, and including uh, an honorary doctorate uh, from the University of Toronto, Ara Mater, uh, as well as many other accolades for her incredible work in justice, equity, inclusion, diversity. I am very pleased to have an opportunity to have a conversation with Camille. Welcome, Camille. Thanks for joining me. You forgot to mention we were classmates at the University of Toronto. Oh, indeed. Indeed. We know each other for a very long time. It's exactly. Camille, you and I were talking a little bit about conflict resolution and and an area that you identified for me, which I thought was something we should explore more fully. And that is the intergenerational uh, conflict that comes up. I, mean, I recall when I first came to Canada, my fights with my dad were always about how he just didn't understand Canadian life. But I think it's much more than just a new immigrant population experience. It's something that can, continues on, and it is something we need to pay attention to. What are some of the things that you have seen in your work over the last little while? Uh, some of the areas that I would identify is, uh, the first one I would identify is, as new immigrants, we tend to spend a lot of time building and committing to building our community. So we do volunteerism, we um, do the work to make our community better. We put resources in to improve our community and we fight for access of our community. What I have seen recently is the newer, the younger kids are no longer only fighting for their own community. They're mm -hmm. joining forces across a number of communities to fight things like racism, um, poverty, not, and so a few of them have identified the issue with their parents who did all the work about improving community to say, why aren't you fighting for our community? And the kids are, the younger folks are now saying, but we will never achieve anything if we only fight for our community. We need to fight about the rights of indigenous people. We need to do that together across all communities. So you're now seeing a bond occur across community, diverse communities, brown kids, black kids, indigenous kids that didn't exist in the new immigrant population. And very often the parents don't understand that. So they think the kids or their youth do not care, but they actually care. Mm -hmm. They just know that success is, goes beyond one community. 
And so it's fascinating to see how the youth from a variety of communities are beginning to work together around homelessness and all these things that they say it's an it's oppression and as long as oppression exists they are at risk so mm -hmm. they are joining forces to fight that yeah so that's one change that i've noticed that's very very significant and creates some intergenerational tension in families and it's all about activism and doing good work <laughs> that's the strange part about it exactly and certainly you know the youth at this stage in life or young young people um it's not surprising that they feel that they have really been given a, a rather short end of the stick right you've got environmental issues you've got climate change right. you've got incredible um inequity in access to resources uh, so there is a sense of frustration amongst the young that we need to pay attention to, right? You, you, we have to, because they will look at folks like me, me, my generation, and say, so you've done all that work, what has changed? Mm -hmm. And we can show progress, but the core changes has not yet occurred the way they expected it to occur. Uh, you know, another thing is at play, the young generation fundamentally believe in quick solutions. <laughs> you know, they're more of an iPhone, instant gratification kind of, and sometimes they have no access or conversation with the previous generation, which says, you know, it took a long time for slavery to be abolished. It took a long time for women's rights to be, you know, have some patience, build on the work of the people who have gone ahead of you, but you you know, you can't solve it within five years. And so they get frustrated because they can't see a solution within five years. They, us, the elders get frustrated with them because they want instant. And yet I have found when we are able to have the conversation um, to give them some freedom to do it their way. And that's the other thing that I have found the way my generation, previous generation did work is not the way the current youth do work, mm -hmm. right? We did letters, um, you know, advocacy, marches, all of those things. They, their tools are completely different. Mm -hmm. They use media, they use Instagram, they use things that I have never even heard about. So they're fighting the same issues, but using different technology and different methodology. So we've got to have the conversation intergenerationally to come to the understanding that we're all doing the same thing, but recognizing the tools differ, you know, rather than be critical of the young folks to say they're not doing the work. They're not doing the work the way we did it, but they're doing the work. And I would say they have even more work to do because they have things like climate change, which we didn't have, which then, you know, when we were looking at our children, we were looking at improving their lives, education for them, housing for them. They're looking at survival with mm -hmm. all the stuff that's happening in the climate change. They're also much more connected across the world right in you know when i was in jamaica i knew what was happening in jamaica i knew a little bit about england in canada we knew about what was happening in the us but not what was happening in afghanistan and all across the world the youth of today that information is theirs they are connecting on a worldwide level so their thinking and strategy span all those divides now <laughs> and so they think differently in that sense. And I'm not saying just let them go off on their own, but I'm saying recognize that it's different and have the conversations that bridge that with them, but give them the room with which to solve their problems, which will be the, their children and their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very different than what we struggled for. Right? We struggle for education, housing, those things. They're struggling for, you know, 
the world, their counterparts in other countries, the rights of women changes now. We see young girls all over the world. Look at what's you know, happening with the death of that young woman. Um, you know, that happened before, but it wasn't our issue in the same way it is their issue today. Mm -hmm. And they certainly seem to, to, you know, maybe it's a perception, but is there a sense that, that not only have we not achieved what we thought we would achieve in the, in the you know, movements that we want, but that we've gone backwards, that in inequity has increased in the world. Um, uh, women's rights, we've got even less of them than we did, you know, a, a year ago. So there is a sense of, of uh, palpable frustration that is important to pay attention to at this stage. Yes, it is. And so, for example, one of the things that I certainly hear the intergenerational divide occurs among my friends and their kids and me and my grandkids. When I graduated from University of Toronto, I had $60,000 in debt, but I knew I would get a job and I would pay it off. Now I see these kids graduating in debt, or even if they do not graduate in debt, in debt. There was jobs when I graduated. You now have these young people with degrees, master's degrees, PhD, and there are no jobs. And so the thing that then you, because you have an education, you will suddenly have a job and make money, pay your way, <laughs> isn't really true for a lot of these young folks. It doesn't mean we don't expect them to be responsible, but their ability to get a good paying job and buy a house is not the same as ours. But I think some, some, several of us who don't understand the fact that we, there are jobs for us and we could save and put a deposit on a house. I don't care how good a young person is in Toronto, the average price of a house is 800,000 now. <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievable. And the intergenerational conversations sometimes do not understand the actual change in this system that have occurred for some of these young people. So mm -hmm. yes, it seems to have gone backwards um, for them because you know they're not advancing generation by generation the way we did. Each generation was better than better off than the last, and it's not true for them. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about conflict and conflict resolution, I think those are some of the ideas that need to be understood, embraced, and included. Some of the other areas for conflict resolution, uh, um, give an example of, you know, we had Thanksgiving recently. And so there was a gathering of the elders in the um, kitchen talking about a young cousin that was a gay man. And it was all whispers. And so one of the young kids came in and they said, did you know? And they said, so what's the problem? And walked out. Like it was absolutely not a problem for this young person. <laughs> Whereas uh, my generation, we were all in the kitchen whispering about it. Indeed. And everybody just looked at each other and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, then when you begin to think like that and look at the generational, you the young cousins view the world and some of those issues differently than the parents and the grandparents. And if that's not understood and actually articulated, you get these tensions. Because yeah. their view of some of the norms and stuff that we held dear, it doesn't mean that they are giving up their culture or anything, but they have some different values around some of those things. And those things need to be discussed and articulated or else it creates um, tension. Um, I'll just digress. I had a family member, not a family member, a friend recently that the parents died and disinherited one of the grandchildren. And the rest of the grandchildren were upset. They were really angry because the reason for not, for disinheriting that child was not acceptable to them. So they got together and said, we are gonna split what we got, which then upset the parents who said, but your granddad deliberately did that. And they're saying, 
but we don't agree with granddad that that was a good enough reason. Mm -hmm. Right? So clearly the family had not had those conversations across the generations before he did his will because everybody loved him. Even the child he disinherited loved him. Mm -hmm. But he had certain values that this, uh, and, you know, did his thing his way, which, you know, his children agreed and supported, but the grandchildren thought it was unfair. <laughs> so how do you build that in to the conversations around uh, dispute, planning, inheritance, all of those things, the intergenerational conversations for me are so key to those conversations. Absolutely. And this ties in so well to some of the work that we're doing around guidelines for ethical wealth transfer and, and inheritance planning, because it's exactly that, is to be able to support younger generations at the time when it's right for them yeah. and, and appropriate, because there's no point in inheriting when, when the, the right time has passed and you really can't utilize that 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 wealth and that opportunity at that time, especially given what we've just said, the circumstances are for young people. And then that sense of fairness and equity, yeah. that is a lesson that they need to learn and continue on with over that period of time. So it is one of those cyclical things where our young are teaching us and we are uh, hopefully uh, leaving for them the right kind of legacy for for development and uh, and a lot of families do believe in equality. Yeah. If one kid got ten dollars, every other child must get ten dollars. But one of those kids may be have a learning disability or may not have done as well academically as the other. So if you want all your kids to have a really decent life. Do one kid then get $20 versus the other kids that, that get 10? How do you have those conversations? Because your goal is the same for all your children, but their needs may differ. And if you do equality, you then perpetuate the that all your kids don't end up in the place that you would like them to end up. So it's a fascinating conversation that I think families need to have together about the difference between equality and equity and what does that mean for us as a family Indeed. and then make decisions from that family perspective yes absolutely and that is just so bang on for the kind of, of work that every family needs to do and to to do that and it 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 is unique for each family in in each Definitely. circumstance Thank Definitely. you very, very much. This has been a very interesting conversation, Camille, and I always love our our kitchen conversations as we as we move through so many different areas of, of, of and spheres of influence in our lives, going back many, many years as classmates. Uh, thank you, Camille, for, thank for you, supporting Zulie, me. And look forward to seeing you in Toronto. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. I hope that this conversation was interesting and insightful for you. In every family, in all of our times, communication is the critical way in which we resolve conflict and deal with practical things that living in the modern world brings for us all. I hope that these conversations that you will be able to seek the assistance of the CAB system if you need that, we are available. And the values that underpin our work are the same values that have been part of our history for 1400 years. Uh, we look forward to meeting with, with many of you and, uh, and appreciate your support. From wherever you are, know that our prayers are there for your good health your safety, and for immense baraka in your lives. Yeah, I know that.